All right, I guess we're online. Um, welcome to the Midwest Mountaineering Outdoor Expo. Um, Kelly and I are here just to talk about our Kekakabic Trail yo-yo that we did last month. So it was uh, uh, six weeks ago, I guess. And um, what I'm going to do is just take a little bit of time to uh, walk through our hike. And then when we're done with that, we'll talk about the things we kind of liked and um, some of the, maybe the gear that we had and any questions you've got. We've got the chat up also, so we can see what um, questions you might have. So feel free to just type in there, hi, or I'm here, or I can't hear you or anything like that. And <laughs> we'll just get going. So basically um, I'm a long distance hiker and I've done a few uh, long hikes, but with the pandemic, things got changed around for us. So this was the big hike that we got to do for this year. And you can see on the screen here, hopefully that we just did it last month, it was 80 miles and we were on there for five days. And um, to tell you where the Keck is, here's a map of uh, Minnesota. We live just off the map down south in Eden Prairie, um, but the Kekakabic Trail is right up east of Ely. And it's part of um, three trails that hook together, the Border Route Trail and the Spear Hiking Trail, the other two, and that's a total of uh, something like 400 miles or so, 440, I guess. And it's also part of the North Country National Scenic Trail, which um, is part of the entire national scenic trail um, program that's in place. There are 11 trails. And in the upper left, there's the National Trail System uh, logo that you might have seen if you've been out on any of these other trails. And it, most people know about the Triple Crown. That's the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, and Continental Divide Trail. Those three are the big ones. They run north-south across the country. Um, the trails at the bottom are the other ones that make up the National Trail System. And the Kekakabic Trail right in the center, plus the Border Route Trail, plus the Superior Hiking Trail, are starting to get known as the Arrowhead Triple Crown, which I think is kind of a fun thing. Um, I'm actually uh, pushing that a little bit to get some of the pressure off the Superior Hiking Trail maybe and onto some of these other ones because they are very, very good trails to go hike to. And those three are a small portion of the North Country National Scenic Trail, which is the longest one of all of them. It's about 4,600 miles. So if you through hike the Keck, you've done I think a little less than 1% of that whole trail. So there's a lot out there. And as far as the other hiking that I've done, um, I've hiked, I've at least put a foot on all of these trails except the last three, New England, Natchez, Trace, and Potomac Heritage. Um, but my son and I threw hike the Pacific Northwest Trail in 2017. I threw hike the Ice Age Trail in 2014, I think, the Arizona Trail in 2012. And then I've hiked on the Florida Trail, Appalachian Trail, and Pacific Crest Trail a little bit. So that's just a little bit about um, why we're here talking about this. Um, the trail itself, the Keck, um, since it is up in the Boundary Waters, you're in the wilderness the entire time, or most of the entire time, so you do have to get permits. And we went on after October 1st, which means that the permits are free instead of having to pay. And you also can do them right at the trailhead. In the lower left of this picture, um, there is a little box where you would put in your per your self-directed uh, permit. A few other things that are really important, I think, when you're going up there is that there are leave no trace practices that you really, really should follow. Um, volunteers are what are used to keep this trail open. So that's a really important thing. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And there are other trails across the Boundary Waters. If you're used to canoeing in the Boundary Waters, you can also just hike. So that's just a little bit about um, why we're talking about this. Um, the what we found after we hiked the trail was that there's kind of five general sections. And we made this up, um, or I guess I did more, more than Kelly. <laughs> but the very west side where we started by Ely, it's all blown down by a windstorm in 1999 was the big one that came through. So there's a lot of blowdowns, but the trail is fine. And then after that, we ran across the flatlands, which is really like walking through a park, I thought. It was a really good trail, um, not much elevation, some low spots, but it was really nice and good hiking. So we're really proud of ourselves hiking through this, making good time. The animation that's going, the black lines, that's where we hiked each day, um, just to give you an idea of, of the land that we covered. 
And then we went into the hill country, which is kind of in the very center of the entire trail. And that's where the trail was still in good shape, but there's more terrain to go up and down. And so that's more the challenging part of it, I think. And that's actually the high point of it is a Kekakabic um, lookout tower that's there, the foundation for it. And then we went into what I call the jungle just because it hasn't been cleared out in the last couple of years. And the guy who runs the um, volunteer group asked me to uh, take a look at that and tell them what I thought. So I just called it the jungle. It's actually really fine, but it was just fun to make it something different. And then we have the sidewalk was the far eastern side, which was really, really easy to hike. Uh, and because it's developed quite a bit, it's close to the Gunflint Trail and people go in there on day hikes. So that's kind of the whole thing. Oh, and the trail is only about five miles from Canada. So just to give you an idea of where we are. Okay. So on the, so just to take you through our, our hike, uh, hopefully pretty quickly. The first day we started on uh, Saturday the 3rd. It was nice and cold and chilly. My toes were cold. Um, Kelly was all bundled up. And this was the blowdown section, just to give you an idea of what we see there. A lot of trees completely ripped off the bedrock because a lot of them don't have a good root system since it's so rocky up there. And we uh, made it to Drumstick Lake, which if anybody's been on the Keck, you've seen this saw blade. It's probably the most photographed spot, I think, on the whole trail a big old logging uh, saw blade that was there. You may see other remnants from um, industry that's been up there before too, because it wasn't always designated as wilderness. Um, so, and so we just hiked through the day and got to um, meet us late where we camped, wonderful campsite. Uh, one thing about it, you might notice the trees are pretty much dead. Um, so that's a concern I have uh, with pretty much the entire area is that the trees have to come down at some point. So when you are setting up, just be aware of where you're putting your tent. I think that's an important thing. And we got a sunset the first day. It was really nice. You notice the lake is like crystal clear calm and uh, it was a nice evening. We had a campfire. We had a campfire pretty much every night except one, I think. Um, and that's rare for me. I'm usually just hiking till the sun goes down and going to bed. So it was nice to have a little bit of extra time. Mm -hmm. The next morning we got up and it wasn't nearly as cold. You can see it's beautiful blue sunny day. So it's October 4th, I guess. Right off the bat, we got to go across a beaver pond. And you'll see, if you like beavers, this is a trail for you because we ran into more than half a dozen of them. And they were a lot of fun. They couldn't care less about us. And there were nice trails off of their dams that you had to walk over. Um, so that was kind of cool. I think there's a video of one here. Hopefully this will play for mm -hmm. you. I'd like to hear in the chat if this did not work well this little short video or not just uh, and I think I'll just play it again but that is a beaver out there that we got to see yep, video works okay and then we uh, stopped for lunch at Strupp Lake campsite beautiful campsite nice view <coughs> actually all of the all the campsites are pretty much exactly like this one there is a fire grate um, plenty of open space around. Um, some of them were pretty tight, I think, it, for more than one tent, um, but it was great. And water was no problem, a lot of water everywhere. And we were lucky because um, there was really nobody else out there. We saw a few people on day one hiking out as we came in, but the campsites were open and we didn't have to share. Yep. Good thing about the going up into the hill country part of it that we called it was that we got up above the trees and this is a view from up there. You know, there's not a lot of mountains or anything anywhere in Minnesota really, but once you got up onto the ridges, you had a nice view out over all the colors and it was a great time of year to be up there. The, the few maples that were around had already dropped their leaves, but all the birch were nice and yellow. And I think there were larch up there too, because I saw some pine trees with yellow. Um, so that was kind of cool. I'm way off on the horizon. You might see one or two white pines sticking up, but there aren't very many from what I could tell. And then we made it to Agamak Bridge, which um, is this structure right in the middle. It's, it's about mile 22 or 23, I think. And that's the view off of both sides of it. I'm going from Agamak Lake down to uh, another little lake. I forget the name of it. Uh, Mueller Lake. Um, so I think it's really cool, but don't lean on the guardrails. They're a little bit flimsy. We'll have to <clears throat> get out there and replace them, I think. And that's where we wound up camping for our second night was at Agamok, another nice campsite. It's made for bigger, larger groups, I think. Okay. 
And that's our kind of our junky place where we just threw everything down just as we set up camp and then we cleaned it up afterwards. The next morning, then we hiked out again, a we climbed up the hill and there's a beaver colony right below us. So we got to watch a beaver in this pond for quite a while. Um, we continued on through the hill country. This is a view back towards Agamock Lake. And so it's a little bit different than canoeing in the Boundary Waters is because you're up above the lakes and you get to see out and, and uh, get a different view of things. So the lake far in the background is Agamock and that's actually a pretty big one from my point of view anyways. Another interesting thing is that the geology has been all scrubbed out by glaciers. Um, and so you'll have a hillside and even up towards the top of the hill where the glaciers came through and there's a soft spot, it'll be dug out. So you'll have a swampy area like this. You would expect it down where the lakes are, but it's up on the hillside. Um, so that was kind of interesting to all of a sudden run into a place that's kind of swampy way up on the side of a hill. Okay. And uh, we were always expecting to see moose. We didn't see any. We didn't see any bear, moose, wolves, any of that stuff, but we saw a lot of small ones, the small animals. And continued on then uh, the next day to uh, Seahorse Lake. You can see here that it's a little bit windy, a beautiful place. The wind brought in uh, a little bit warmer weather from the south, um, but Seahorse was the one spot where uh, the trail was wet. And Mike, we might consider doing a little work on that, I guess. I don't know if it's because of beaver. I imagine it is, but if we could get the trail up a little bit, that would be cool. But that was the only place where we had an issue and we didn't get our feet wet there either. We just kind of climbed up on the side of the hill a little bit. And I think I've got a little video of the how windy it was while we walked by Seahorse. And after that, then we just kept hiking to the end of the trail. This is Paulson Mine and uh, on the east end of the trail, it's built up quite a bit more. There's a, what's called the Centennial Trail, a loop that's 3.3 miles that people stop on the Gunflint. The Gunflint Trail is actually a road called the Gunflint Trail. So people will stop there, do this little day hike and then leave. So there's a lot to see there. There's old homesteads and a mine, uh, this mine hole and some other things. There's also Mine Lake, which you can hike to. This is just the, um, eastern terminus that we got to. So. And so it took us two days and six hours to hike the whole trail. And if you notice, we're not wearing our packs because we stopped at um, Bin Bingshik Lake where we were camping for the night, dropped our packs there, hiked three miles and then three miles back. So we didn't have to carry our packs for six miles. So if you're gonna do a yo-yo of it, you might wanna consider that it saves you a lot of effort that one day. So one tip, I guess. And this is the view at our Bingshik Lake campsite. It's actually in the morning because when we got there after our hike, we got there just as it started raining. So there's no pictures of the evening, but this is the next morning and it was really, really pretty. And luckily we had set up our tent before we headed off without our packs. We came back with, and the tent was set up for us already. And then the next day was pretty much just hike through uh, drizzle and sun and drizzle and sun. The wind was blowing through wave after wave of clouds um, being this time of year. We kind of expected that. We got to Harness Lake where we set up camp and this is our campsite there. Um, well, there's not much more to say except there we are. The next day was the same thing, wind with uh, rain and sun and rain and sun. So Kelly put her uh, rain poncho on. I put it on, I think once because I just let the rain get on me and it would dry off in 10 or 15 minutes. So it wasn't a big deal. And the weather was so nice. And this is just uh, what we had to eat when we got to Drumstick Lake, which was our last campsite. Um, so not too exciting there. And this is a video that to prove we did have rain. This was Drumstick Lake. So it wasn't all beautiful sunny weather. I always say that when you're out on a hike, you never really see the pictures of the bad weather because you're all bundled up and trying to avoid it. And then we made it the last morning, then we hiked out and we ran into these two hikers just coming in. And it's, it turns out the very first day, we ran into a grouse hunter with three grouse on his way out. And then on the last day, we ran into these guys, but the entire time we saw no people um, on the trail. So it was just us. So it really was like we were out in the wilderness. We really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much just the overview of the, of the hike. 
Um, and just to give you an idea of what it was like hiking there, this video um, is pretty much of just Kelly of all the different sections of the trail. So there's the blowdowns and the normal flatlands, really nice, easy trail. No poles there. A little bit of the hills. Not a bad one. A bad one. And there were a few boggy spots, but not too many. When we were hiking out on um, through the hills, I think it was would have been on day four. It had just rained, so going down those hills with the rocks and roots was really quite slippery. It was good that we had poles. And a beaver dam. It was cool walking across the beaver dams. And you can see that little blue flag that she just walked past. Um, that's the only real trail markings that are out there. So you really need to keep your eyes open for little bits of blue, whether it's laying on the ground or on a on a limb, because um, in the wilderness, they don't want like signs every five feet or so. So if you've been on the Appalachian Trail or even the Ice Age Trail and the Spear Hanging Trail with its blue blazes, it's not like that. You need to see this trail and go on it. Good thing about it from my point of view is that I figure if you can take five steps, you're on the trail because the forest is so thick that you really can't veer off of it. The one spot where you can get in trouble is when a portage trail crosses the trail that you're on. We ran into one spot where uh, the Keck ran right into a portage trail. So you go left or right. Those are the only two options. And if you go left, you run into a lake. If you turn right, then the Keck takes a left off of that. So you made kind of a, a, a Z, I guess but there's no markings. So it, easy, good thing about it is that you run into a lake, you turn around and go back. So it's not a big deal. Yeah. And this is the blowdowns area. Some of the, the, you can see that the trees were burned out and blown down. So there is a lot of dead wood around, which over time will probably cause trouble. I expect there'll be more burns um, as time goes on. But the trail's been done a lot of work and it's open and it's in really good shape. And this is just another overlook with, again, a big charred snake from a fire that has happened in the past. So with our, somebody asked about a sleeping bag. I, I make my, some of my own gear and I made my own uh, sleeping quilt. And so it works down into the 20s without any problem. Yeah, and I don't, I, I think mine was a 20 degree one. I, I borrowed it from my son, but it was, it was just fine. But I also slept in long underwear as well. And I like to be warm. And as far as the weather goes, it was chilly every morning. Our last morning, this picture, we had frost. We, we had to search pretty hard, but we found some frost on leaves. Other than that, it was down into the uh, low 30s, mid 30s every morning. And then with the sun, it felt it was, I enjoyed it. I thought it was great hiking weather, mm -hmm. but it was just a little bit chilly in the morning, but it was nice. And then there, we had days like this also. This is, I guess, probably my favorite picture that we got from the, from the hike because it was just beautiful blue skies often. And so quiet. I mean, just there was just no one else out there. It was, it was great. Yep. And one of the fun things I like to do was trail work. Um, I think if you are planning on going on the Keck or the border route or any trail in the Boundary Waters, if you can get a hold of somebody who's responsible for the maintenance, ask them, is there anything you can do? Um, Eric, who uh, is the volunteer coordinator of the Keck, he let me take a little saw with me. Um, and I cleared out, this is a spot where a beaver had gotten a little over anxious and cut down a bunch of trees. And so I cleared them off of the way. And so that was a lot of fun. Um, it was gave me something to do. Kelly was leading the way on the way out. And so I would do a little work and then catch up and do a little work and catch up. So that was fun. And that was the other place that I, um, beside the portage, there was one place where there was a beaver dam where I missed the turnoff for the trail. And this is me doing my trail work. He carried that saw with him.
What's a yo-yo hike? Uh, somebody asked what a yo-yo hike is, and that is when you hike all the way to the end of the trail and turn around and come back. So some people do that like on the Pacific Crest Trail, which is 2,500 miles long. Oh. Um, but this one, the trail is only 40 miles. And so that would have only taken two or three days for us to do. It would have taken three if we had done that. So we decided to yo-yo, that is go all the way to the end and then come all the way back. So we could just park our car, do the whole hike and then leave in our car. Otherwise we'd have to arrange to shuttle at the other end. So a yo-yo is just hiking a trail out and back. Other things about it is I love the glacial terrain. I think I mentioned that already, but this is a huge erratic that some glacier just decided to plop here. And this was all covered in ice 17,000 years ago is the estimate, I guess. And so it's kind of interesting to notice that the terrain has been all scoured out by glaciers. And here again is a, a little blue blaze that you can look for. The other new, another cool part about it was hiking on beaver dams. Your footing isn't really good going across all these logs, but it was really cool to see all the work they had done. It's amazing how much work beavers can do. I was saying, I think that if the Keck uh, maintenance crew could entice the beavers to chop down all the trees along the trail in exchange for food, that might work out pretty good. Cairns are also very, very important. They were really cool. The one right in the middle is the best built cairn I've ever seen in my life. It's like made out of bricks almost. But keep your eyes open for them because there are some parts of the trail where um, it's open and that's the only thing that you can see. The other thing I'd point out is don't add to them and don't build your own because it can just get confusing to people. Um, there are maintenance crews that go through here every year and they'll take care of that. And the same thing's true on other trails is stacking rocks along the trail um, can just make things confusing for people. But there is art. Uh, I mean, they, they look really cool, the ones that are useful, and you can see them down the trail and, and take advantage of them. And it's nice to see them when you're out on the trail and there really isn't a trail, it's just you're going across rocks. They're, you're happy to see those. So the few animals that we did see, um, there's a fish jumping out there someplace. That's the only fish I saw. And we saw, like I said, a handful of beavers. They were probably my favorite part. And a few different birds. And the, the squirrels and chipmunks are extremely aggressive. They're used to people leaving food at the campsite. They did not like us a lot. And we mentioned that we saw a grouse hunter the first day. There were tons of grouse too. It's my favorite. So that was enjoyable. Another thing I liked about this trail was the pace. I got to slow down a little bit. Um, so this is just a picture of me, I think Drumstick Lake where I was resting. But a few things to point out here, I guess, is the plastic that I'm laying on is actually my disposable rain poncho. We should have had better rain gear really. But this is what I'm used to taking with me on long hikes that doesn't weigh anything and it keeps the rain off for the most part. And I just hike till I'm dry. I've got some astral um, shoes, which work great. I got those this year because I'm part of a group called the Groundskeepers. I'll mention that later. Um, lower left, there are Sour Patch Kids way down in the lower left, which are our favorite um, junk to eat. And right above that is my disposable water bottle. We have water bottles on the front of our packs kind of to help offset the weight and that works pretty well. And it's easy to get to them too while you're hiking. Yep. And then I've got my darn tough socks on which are extremely expensive, but if you wear them out, they send you a new pair. And so I've been wearing these for quite a while. This is like my third pair, I think. So that's kind of cool. And I've got a spot messenger that I carry with me all the time. Um, just really when I'm out there to track my progress. So on my website, people can see that, but it's also for SOS also. And um, there are other ones, there's an inReach and now there's coming with a few different ones also. Okay. And you see my poles in the upper, upper left, those are from Walmart, they're really inexpensive. My son's got them for me in 2011 and they refuse to wear out. So I keep using them, but hiking poles, I think are really, we, we had a debate about this. Should you have hiking poles on this trail or not? For our situation, I use the hiking poles to keep our tent set up, but 
half the time they're really useful. The other half, they're not worth the effort because of the brush and the grass on the side of it. You really can't get them out in front of you. It's more work to use them than it is to walk. So you need to be flexible and, and use them when you can, I guess, if you're going to have hiking poles. Yeah, we had a, a great system because on those times when the weeds on the sides were making the poles more of a problem, then we just let them slide behind us. So that was great. We'll show about food storage. Someone asked. Yep. And you wanted to talk? Um, oh, yeah, I, I wanted to say that I really need to stay warm. So Paul, when he does long distance hiking, he doesn't usually bring something to make hot food. And, and he showed you his rain gear. And he also hikes 20 miles or more a day, which isn't something that I've done. So anyway, so for me and my need for comfort, he did bring a little stove and he'll show you that in a bit. Um, also, I, um, I found that the clothes that I brought were just fine and just really small things I was able to adjust as I was hiking to cool myself down or warm myself up. And it was just simple things like um, using my buff over my ears to keep them warm and then um, having it as a headband if I was getting hot or putting my hood up again if I was um, hot or cold using that. And then also you can see on my hands, I've got the... Um, the shirts that have the place for your thumb to go through, I could adjust that to um, help me stay warmer or cooler in my gloves. So super easy things that I could adjust as I was hiking to keep myself comfortable. And there, like I said, there's no shortage of water in the Boundary Waters, um, but you can't just drink it. I know in the old days, and some people now still just canoe out in the middle of the lake and scoop it up and drink it, but that's a little too challenging for me, especially when you're hiking, you're getting it off the shore, and you really should filter or treat everything. You either filter, boil, UV light, or chemicals. And this is the Sawyer Squeeze that I've been using since 2012, the same device, and it works really well for me. So. Um, I've adjusted it a little bit so that that you can see where it hooks into the bottle. I've super glued uh, another cap onto it, which fits my bottle. So there's no drippage or anything like that. And so that's just something that I'm used to. So whatever you do, you know, treat your water um, just to stay safe out there. And then our food, somebody asked about that, I think. But, How we start it too. Um, there was a, I'm, I was part of a group this year called the Groundskeepers. Um, and it's put on by Granite Gear in uh, Twin Harbors, Minnesota. And you can actually sign up for that right now. It sounds like a plug, but if you go to Hiking Dude, I just blogged about it, but you can apply to be a groundskeeper for next year if you wanted to. And one of the sponsors of that is Food for His Soul. So they gave us a bunch of food. And so I got to finally try that out this time. And actually it was really good. You look at the, the titles of these roasted sweet potatoes with kale and quinoa. I don't think I'd ever really buy that, but it was really pretty good stuff. So um, we enjoyed doing that. And all you have to do is boil water and add it. So right in the center is our little alcohol stove. Um, it's just made out of a pop can and pour an ounce of alcohol in it. And it's enough to boil a cup and a half or so of water and then use that to heat up the, the food. And I don't, it doesn't show it here, but I made this out of an old blue sleeping pad and it's a, a pouch. And so you pour the water into the pouch of food, put it in here, close it up. And then this really insulates it and keeps it warm uh, for 15 minutes until it's ready to go. So that's all we did. And then way over on the right, the white bag is our ursac bag. And that's what we did for food protection. This is the ursac with other food that we took also. So we just use uh, ursac bags to for bear and mostly for rodent is really my biggest concern pretty much wherever I go. Um, and you can see here a selection of the other food that we took. Anything to say about the food? Um, I dried a bunch of fruit before I left and um, overestimated how much I would need. I had two big gallon, um, not gallon, the quart size Ziplocs of dried fruit and I only ate one of them. That, yeah, Paul didn't have the dried fruit, but I enjoyed it. So another little tip way over on the right is a canister and that's actually a Walmart Pringles knockoff. So a, can, a cardboard can of Pringles, a um, lot of calories, they're tasty. You eat them the first day or the first two days and then you've got a garbage can. And we pretty much 
compacted all of our garbage into one of those cans. They're so strong that you just keep shoving and shoving and shoving the food wrappers in there and it will compress and you can use all of it. So I, on all my long hikes, pretty much, I buy one or two of those as I'm uh, resupplying. Um, and then we also had uh, some protein bars mm. and those were pretty good. Yep, we found those at Aldi has some really nice protein bars that were a great breakfast. And these are our food bags just uh, tied onto a pine tree there. And they're, if you look at the manufacturers, what they recommend, you really just need to tie them to a tree. Uh, you don't need to hang them up 10 feet out or anything like that. The idea is that you don't want a bear to have it on the ground and crush it with all its weight is the big concern. One thing about them, they are flexible and your food that's in there will get squished. If you have potato chips, they're just gonna get squished. But if you had gushy stuff like peanut and peanut butter and jelly, then it's going to make a big mess. And so that's the big concern with those. But they're much lighter than a bear canister. This is a shelter we used. Um, if you look at it and go, oh my, he sure set that up terribly. Well, this was at Harness Lake and this was the flattest spot we could find. So <laughs> it's a little bit slanty, but this is by Bear Paw Wilderness Designs in Colorado. The guy uh, um, gave me this to try out a few years ago and it works great. Kelly and I have used it in the Boundary Waters now and in Wyoming and other backpacking and stuff. So it's very, very lightweight. It's actually... It just uses his um, hiking poles and then the tent stakes. This is the whole thing right in here. And it doesn't it doesn't weigh very much. I'm, I'm, I really try to carry as little as I can as I get older and older, especially. But um, the lighter, the better as far as I'm concerned. The same thing is true with the food that we were talking about is that um, carry it just what I need and carry it as light as I can. So that's the conversation that we often have is that balance between being prepared and um, hiking light yeah. and then personal preference and needs. So our favorite spots on the trail, mine is on the left, that's Agamock Bridge. I thought it was just really cool. There's this ravine. And if you look on the internet for Agamock Bridge, you'll see a lot of pictures of just torrents of water running through here. But this time of year, everything is much drier. So it looked a lot different. I thought that was kind of cool. So that was my favorite spot. Mm -hmm. And my favorite thing was just the beavers. It was so fun to um, watch them. <laughs> so um, Paul had, um, a, a few weeks earlier, Paul had me hike a shorter summit from Lake Superior up to the tallest place. Eagle Mountain. Eagle Mountain. Yeah. And it was 18 miles each day because we did a little yo-yo each day. We started in the middle and hiked up and back down and then from the middle down to the lake and back up. And by the end of that, my feet were a mess because that was the longest hiking I had done. And so I borrowed these socks from him, took good care of my toenails and for the most part, my feet were okay on this trip. Um, after the hills and the rocks and the roots, I was starting to get some blisters, but was able to care for that using um, moleskin and some band-aids. So there you go. But I think that was the biggest challenge on that. We were, everything was worked out really well on this. We were, I think, fairly well prepared and things went great. Mm -hmm. One funny story, I think, Every one of my every one of my long hikes, I said the uh, Arizona Trail and Ice Age Trail and all of those thousands of miles, I've always find at least one mylar balloon. And on this one, this was at mile 20, right in the very dead center of the trail, a chipmunk ran across the road and went behind an erratic. And so I looked over there to see if I could see him. And he was gone, of course, but here's his balloon laying there in the duff. So I picked it up. I said, it was it was really heavy and wet. And so I set it in the middle of the trail and put a rock on it. And I figured once we go down to the end of the trail, I'd pick it up on our way back. So we hike to the end of the trail. Three days later, we come by this spot. My rock is sitting there. There's no balloon. There's no way it could have blown away. It was under a rock. And so we go, well, that is weird. That was a good conversation for several miles. Yep. <laughs> yeah, for a mile. Because a mile, yeah. a mile and a quarter down the trail... The picture on the right is I looked over in the, I was looking over uh, the, the view and there's the balloon laying in the brush. And so I don't know how that balloon got a mile and a quarter from where I had it under a rock to here. But if you have any ideas, you can put them in the chat and let us know. My, I think a moose got it hooked on an antler because we saw no other people the entire time. Oh yeah, that's right. So sleeping pad. Yes, yeah, sleeping pad. I use just a, I use uh, usually now just a 
blue pad you'll see that on kelly's backpack but which one did you use um i think it's an rei brand one but i'm oh your green one yeah that new green one that i have it's probably not up here no. Maybe a nice, a nice inflatable one that she's got. She got for her birthday, I think. Right. Yeah. So this, this is a map. This is if you didn't want to yo-yo, you just hiked from Snowbank Lake to County Road. You'd have to figure out how to get back to your car. So a, a shuttle is one option. It's a little bit expensive. Or if you've got a buddy, maybe you have two people or two groups of people. One hiking from the east, one hiking from the west. And you can exchange keys in the middle. But this is one of this is the big reason why we yo-yoed was it was just so much easier to hike back than to drive this distance around. Okay. I also wouldn't recommend big groups on the Keck. The campsites are kind of small. So like a Boy Scout troop or something like that, if it was more than six people, I think that some of the sites would be really, really tight. You could do it, but I wouldn't, I don't know if that would be that much fun. Okay, volunteers are extremely important on the Keck. And so if you get a chance to uh, join them, this is what I'm planning on doing next year. Now that I said it and it's recorded, I probably have to do it, I guess. <laughs> but it's a great way to get out on the trail, meet people that know about it, learn about the trail and hike just a little part of it. Um, sometimes what they do, especially for the sections in the middle is they'll have a canoe trip into those and then do the trail work and canoe out. So you kind of get a mixture of both. And uh, at the end of this, there'll be a URL where you can get a hold of that if you want to. So volunteer maintenance is the critical thing for this trail and all of the spear hiking trail border route trail they're all the same situation so anytime you can volunteer on those this is uh the 2020 crews went out and these are the sections that they got to just to let you know that they really did a lot of work this year and so when we hit the trail it was in great shape one of the another reason why we didn't go in september which would have been nice for the colors is that that's when all the crews were out there and we thought it'd be really crowded with us hiking and them there um, so that didn't work out. And then your question should be, well, why didn't you just help out with the crews? <laughs> and it's because uh, they had already had crews set up and with the pandemic, at least some of them anyways, were just a small group of people like families and stuff. And so that just didn't work out. But next year. And, and um, what we want, are you going to tell them what we want to do as far as the border up trail and then the superior? Is that? Sure, go ahead. I, I don't know if I know how to explain oh. that. Um, we'll get, we'll get, what we would like to do is uh, on the border route trail is hike from where we stopped on the Kekakopic trail and the Gunflint trail is start there with the border route trail heads east, wraps around to the top of the spear hiking trail and down to Grand Marais and do that and that whole hike probably yeah. next summer. Yeah. So that'd be a little bit farther for Kelly. That'd be like 120 miles, I think. Mm -hmm. When we were done with our hike, then we stopped in Ely and we went to the Dorothy Moulter Museum. She's the root beer lady, if you know about the Boundary Waters at all. Um, she's pretty famous. Um, and there's a book or there's a few books about her, but very, very interesting to read about her. The museum was kind of fun. Um, Kelly had wanted to go there forever, so we stopped there. But Ely is a really cool town. There are lots of restaurants and places to stay. Um, Steger Mucklucks are there and Gators Grilled Cheese Emporium. I've eaten there. They're interesting. And there's the Wolf Center. And I was looking just on Google, there's seven liquor stores and 17 canoe outfitters. So, <laughs> so two questions. Oh, yeah. One of the questions is about the max size being nine because it's the Boundary Waters. Yep. And I would say, I can't even imagine having nine in a, any of these campsites. So if you were with a bigger group, I don't know if you'd, it would be a challenge to find tent sites within that. And then the Mine yep. Lake reroute. Yeah, and when you do your permit that is nine, whether you're hiking or canoeing, they, that still is in place. And on the far east side, there is the mine lake and the trail, I guess, has been rerouted up onto the hill. And I really didn't notice it that much. It seemed like it was just a nice flow and that's where the trail was supposed to be. So from my point of view, it was easy to follow and the trail was in great shape. So, and we were, I don't know where it used to be because it's the only time I've been on it, but we were up above Mine Lake and we could actually see a beaver. We saw two beavers in Mine Lake. Um, so that was kind of cool. And the weather was nice, so that helped too. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in there. Um, and I'm just going to leave this up here. I wanted to say that 
I do have hiking dude uh, stickers. So if you send an email to hiking at hiking dude today, so if I get it before midnight tonight, I can, and then I can get a hold of you and get your address and send you a sticker because that just proves that you are here, I guess. Oh, you've got one on there. <laughs> hey. And uh, my site is the hiking dude site. And then keck.org will actually redirect you to a web page on the North Country National Scenic Trail. But if you want to learn more about the keck, um, that is there. Really, volunteering is extremely important. And you may have heard that the keck, oh, it's a terrible trail and you'll get lost and it's overgrown and it's, ah. Uh, it was in awesome shape. Um, it was, the tread was much like the spear hiking trail, but just not worn down as much. But as far as difficulty and stuff goes, I've through hiked the spear hiking trail too. I think that this is comparable to that. Um, and I, I thought it was a hard hike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Yep. And then I did say that I was a member of the groundskeepers group. And so if you go to groundskeepers.org, you can apply there for 2021 if you're interested. And the idea with that is that um, you're saying you're going to go out and do uh, 300 plus miles of hiking next year, and you're going to take something along to pick up garbage. Kelly and I this year, we've picked up, it's like 515 pounds now on our hikes. And that's not out in the wilderness. That's around here on our day hikes and stuff. So um when Paul was talking about the trail and losing the trail, at the time we went, the um, it had just been cut back and also the um, ferns were, I don't know, dying, kind of end of the season. So we could see the trail pretty easily. I could see in the summertime with the ferns big and green that it could be, you could wonder if that was a trail or not. Somebody asked about fishing. I love fishing. Um, I think that it would be a great thing if you had a collapsible pole to take with you from the shore. You could probably do very well. I can think of a couple of campsites that look like fishing should be pretty good there. Um, then again, it would cut into your hiking time. So, and in oh, so the the trail used to be in water around Mine Lake. Well, it's great now. Once the one spot, the one mistake I made. Um, with navigation is we were coming to Fay Lake. So coming from west to east, we hit Fay Lake and we're hiking along the trail. It's just no problem, nothing to be concerned with. And all of a sudden I hit the lake and the trail stops. <laughs> what, what happened? And there's just no trail anymore. So we go back maybe 50 feet or so and there's a little blue ribbon and uh, uh, you can see the trail goes uphill. But it wasn't even, it wasn't, the we were going this way, the trail wasn't even 90 degrees. It was more like um, 70 or 80, I guess. And so if you're not looking for it, there's no reason to even think it would go back and up. And mm -hmm. so that's the one spot where um, we misnavigated for a minute, so. Yeah. I think that's probably all that we have. I know we've got some time. So Kelly and I are just going to hang around. And if there's some questions that show up or something, I guess. And uh, and otherwise, we really appreciate you uh, stopping by and uh, letting us chat at you for a while. And I hope you get up on the keck. Um, oh, if, if you are interested in uh, needing somebody to go on a backpacking trip with you, just holler. Yep. <laughs> and I'll say, since I'm not a, a person who does is used to long distance hiking. Um, my longest day was 16 or 17, but you know, I was able to do it. And like Paul said, we didn't have super long days. So um, you can do it. <laughs> I'm just looking to see if there was any more advice that I had. Uh, nope, just don't put smokehouse almonds and jerky in the same bag together because they don't taste okay. good like mustard and chocolate well thank you very much appreciate you guys uh giving us your time thank you